Why do some people develop chronic pain after surgery? I have many patients who come to me for treatment of chronic pain that started after they had surgery for a inguinal hernia, cesarean section, mastectomy, heart surgery, back surgery, and other types of surgery. Some of these people had pain before their surgery and that was the reason why they ended up in surgery. However, many others did not have pain before and now they have constant, persistent, chronic pain. If you are a person in this situation, then watch this video to the end because I will show you how you can cope with this pain and how you can prevent this from happening again. And it does not involve taking pills. So let's talk about chronic post-surgical pain today. The numbers are staggering. 15% of women develop chronic abdominal pain after a C-section. 5 to 56% of people develop chronic pain after surgery to remove their gallbladder. One in three people develop chronic pain after a inguinal hernia repair. Up to 32% develop chronic pelvic pain after uterus removal or hysterectomy. Up to 81% develop chronic pain after an amputation. And these are just some examples. The list is too long for me to talk about in this video. When surgeons obtain consent to operate on their patients, they must explain all the possible complications of the surgery. And every surgeon will inform their patients that there is a risk they will develop chronic pain after this procedure. So there are two main questions here. First, why some people develop persistent pain after surgery and others don't? And second, what can be done to prevent or eliminate this pain? Let's talk about the first one. A lot of progress has been made in the past 50 years to answer this question. If the surgery is the same, the surgeon, the hospital are the same, why does one person have this complication and not everyone? Many basic scientists have investigated the transition from acute to chronic pain in animal models. Scientists who do research with humans, volunteers or patients with health problems have also discovered many factors that are involved in the transition from acute to chronic pain. There are so many possibilities involved here and many clinician scientists may disagree with some of these explanations. But there is one thing that all clinician scientists agree, that wound pain is a critical factor responsible for the post-operative chronic pain. So here comes the first strategy to reduce post-operative pain, reduce pain during surgery. Try to do minimal possible number of cuts, reduce the time of surgery, provide adequate pain analgesia and anesthesia to minimize pain. This topic is extremely important that the International Association for the Study of Pain or ISP recently gave a name for this disease and it's included in the most recent version, the ICD-11 or the 11 version of the International Classification of Diseases. The code is MG30.21. According to the International Classification of Diseases, persistent post-operative pain has greater intensity or different pain characteristics than pre-operative pain and is a continuum of acute post-operative pain that may develop after an asymptomatic period. The International Classification of Diseases defined the duration for persistent post-operative pain at three months post-surgery because healing times differ among different procedures. Most of what I'm teaching in this video is from a 2018 review published in Anesthesiology by Dr. Philippe Richebet from the University of Montreal in Quebec, Canada. I also read many articles published by my colleagues from Toronto, Dr. Hans Clark and Dr. Joe Katz, who have published extensively on this topic and built a novel transitional pain program to address the transition from acute to chronic post-surgical pain. Before I continue, let me remind you that this video is for educational purposes only. If you need medical advice, please talk to your doctor. If there is any emergency, go to the nearest emergency department or call an ambulance. Basic scientists work with animal models. 
they identified various changes that happen at the time of surgery. These changes happen at the cell level in the peripheral and the central nerve system. There is also inflammation and nerve injury that leads to changes in the pain system. We call this synaptic plasticity or sensitization. I have another video that explains what is central sensitization. But here, we're talking about peripheral sensitization too. What is peripheral sensitization? Well, when the surgeon uses the scalp to cut the skin, muscle, fascias, veins, bones, organs, etc., there are several gene changes in the neurons that transmit pain sensations to the spinal cord and to the brain. The genes that connect the production of nerve growth factor, or NGF, is modified. That makes sense because the body is kind of noticing that some nerves are being cut and they will need to regrow. However, this will also sensitize the neurons that transmit pain to the brain, making the pain formation easier to arrive at the brain, what we call facilitation. In addition to NGF, there are also local cytokines and substance P involved, which will perpetuate a stage of activation of pain, even after the surgical incision has closed, and even after weeks or months that the incision and all the internal cuts have healed. In summary, the acute pain provoked some changes in the pain processing pathways, and now what is left is a memory of pain. It is real. I'm not saying the person is imagining or inventing this pain. The pain is felt very real and it's annoying, but the origins of this pain are in the pain system, not the tissues that have been cut. So, are there any strategies here to reduce post-operative pain? Well, but there are more. Let's talk about the changes that occur in the spinal cord. At the time of surgery, there are changes that happen in the spinal cord. The spinal cord is where all the neurons of the body arrive, bringing information about what's happening in the periphery. So, if the neurons are bringing a lot of information that something is happening in a part of the body, the spinal cord has to transmit that information to the higher boss, the brain. But before the spinal cord sends messengers to the boss, the spinal cord has to decide what is important and what is not. So, at the spinal cord, there are neurons that will talk to each other, we call this synapses. There will be a lot of conversation in the spinal cord, and pain sensitization in the spinal cord is mainly due to glutamate. Glutamate will activate the NMDA receptors, and this will increase the volume of pain that arrives at the brain. Other neurotransmitters are also involved here, for example, BDNF, or brain-derived neurotrophic factor. It is also interesting to note that here, not only the neurons are talking to each other, but the glial cells are involved in this conversation too. Glial cells are not neurons. They are cells that support the neurons, and for a long time, nobody knew what they were supposed to do, until some researchers, including Dr. Mike Salter from the University of Toronto, discovered that they were quite important. Here come more strategies to reduce post-operative pain. Opioids. Oh no, <laughs> opioids are used during surgery. They are essential to a successful anesthesia. I'm not saying that anesthetists should not give them at the time of surgery or for a short period after surgery. What I'm talking about here is using opioids after surgery for weeks, months, or years. Yes, opioids are bad then. Opioids activate the NMDA receptors, which will transmit more pain to the brain. This is called opioid-induced hyperalgesia. This is already well established. In addition, opioids will also increase the amount of substance P and will activate the glial cells. So, opioids will overactivate pain sensitization processes. Yes, that's bad news because in many places they treat post-operative pain with opioids. It's like adding gasoline to the fire. Number two, stress. Any surgical procedure is considered a stressful situation. It is stressful to the body, to the mind, to the person as a whole, to the family, to the hospital, to everyone. 
Stress increases the expression of AMPA receptors and this will lead to activation of calcium-dependent kinase, which leads to persistent sensitization. This is linked to the activation of the sympathetic nerve system, the autonomic nervous system that we have that is responsible for the flight or fight response. There is activation also of the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. There is a lot of release of adrenaline and cortisol by our body. These are the stress hormones. And we know that stress hormones sensitize the pain system. They make our brain more alert to pain. So you may be asking yourself, how long do these changes last? These changes last for a long time. Okay, I know the next question, what is a long time? Most of the studies are from animals in the laboratories, so their lifespan is shorter than humans and it's hard to translate from animal studies to humans. There are few clinical studies in humans and because humans are different, it really varies and varies a lot. But there are reports of this sensitization becoming permanent in some individuals, while others are able to get rid of them in a few months. This brings us to the strategies. What can be done here to avoid peripheral sensitization and sensitization of the spinal cord? The key word here is allostasis, the active process by which the body responds to daily events and maintains homeostasis. Homeostasis is a state of stable equilibrium. How does the body reach that stable equilibrium after surgery? This might be different from person to person, from culture to culture, from country to country. There are ways to activate a person's descending pain inhibitory pathways. Our brain has this ability to activate the diffusion noxious inhibitory control activity. This is a long and complicated name, but in simple terms, the brain is able to shut down all of this sensitization. Remember, the brain is the big boss. The brain is in control of all of the systems. And remember, you are in control of your brain. You have a mind over your brain. You can tell your brain to reduce sensitization. Yes, you can. Remember, all the sensitizations were created after surgery. You were not born with them. In the same way that your brain and your pain system created those things, they can be undone. They can be reverted. And for this, we need to use mind-body therapies. No medication will do that for you. I know it's easier than to take a pill. That would be wonderful if we could take a pill and revert all of these processes. But no, there is no pill. Your brain will need to work. And it's not the psychologist or the mental health counselor that will do this for you. There is no magic word that they will say to you and all of this process will be undone. You will have to study, to learn and to understand this process and you will have to do it for yourself. So here are the strategies to revert sensitization, mind-body therapies. I have another video that I talk about them. So why do some people develop chronic post-operative pain and others don't? First, let me summarize the pre-surgery factors that put a person at higher risk of developing chronic pain after surgery. These are risk factors that the person has even before the surgery has occurred. So pain before surgery. If the person had chronic pain prior to surgery, their chances of developing post-surgical pain are higher. Repeated surgeries. People who take opioids prior to surgery. In a study of patients who went to trachotomy for heart surgery, the number of people who developed chronic pain post-surgery was 48% among those who were long-term users of opioids and only 5% among people who were not users of long-term opioids. Genetics. There is some polymorphism of catecholamine O methyltransferase polymorphism and melanocortin 1 receptor gene polymorphism in red-haired women that are associated with higher response to opioids. Well, that sounds interesting, but my colleague Dr. Jeffrey Mogel from McGill University in Canada is a world expert in this area and the last time I asked him he said, Andrea, we don't know anything yet. 
Dr. Joe Katz, a professor of psychology at York University in Toronto and a colleague of mine, is a world expert in this area. It is fascinating to watch his lectures, but basically every single psychological factor that predisposes a person to chronic pain, to develop chronic post-surgical pain, are anxiety, depression, fear, lack of support, stress, attention, visual memories, executive function, and a pessimistic personality, which is a person that has a tendency to only think that the worst will happen to them. Poor physical fitness. Have you heard of prehabilitation? My colleague, Dr. Hans Clark, is an anesthetist at the same hospital where I work, UHN, and he recently conducted a systematic review of preoperative exercises known as prehabilitation. What his group showed was that total body prehabilitation reduces postoperative pain, increases physical function, and reduces hospital length of stay. So now I'll summarize some risk factors that occur at the time of the surgery. The intensity of pain during surgery is very important. The more intense the pain, the more sensitization will occur. So the pain has to be treated aggressively during and immediately after surgery. However, there are some types of analgesics that should be avoided. For example, remifentanil is a type of opioid that is very well known for causing opioid-induced hyperalgesia. Nerve injury during surgery. It would be ideal if the surgeon avoids cutting nerves, but of course, sometimes that's not possible. Every time a nerve is cut, there is a possibility to start a new type of pain, which is called neuropathic pain. If you want to learn more about this kind of pain, watch my other video here. Surgeons are developing minimally invasive techniques. These are very promising procedures because they don't need to cut too many nerves to achieve the same surgical results. Is there any medication that we can use to prevent the pain? In technical terms, this is called preventive analgesia, where we give pain medications even before the pain started. It seems that non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs may inhibit the cyclooxygenase enzymes and prevent sensitization. That includes COX-1 and COX-2 inhibitors, as well as acetaminophen. Corticosteroids may reduce inflammation associated with tissue injury and sensitization. However, this is very controversial. Well, the type of anesthesia, regional or general anesthesia. Regional anesthesia might be able to reduce the incidence of persistent postoperative pain. These are things like nerve blocks or epidurals. In some hospitals, they do continuous wound infiltration with morphine or local anesthetics for about 72 hours. The studies have contradictory results. What about intravenous lidocaine, a local anesthetic that has also been used in some centers? Well, they started some infusion prior to surgery and maintained it until one hour after the skin closure. And a meta-analysis of four clinical reports did not show results too exciting. Ketamine is a substance that blocks the NMDA receptors and we learned that this would be a good idea. During the last 10 years, many anesthetists are starting to give intravenous ketamine for the post-operative period to about 48 hours after surgery. A Cochrane review published by my colleague in Canada, Dr. Luis Chaparro, showed that the results are interesting and promising. What about gabapentin and pregabalin? They are known as gabapentinoids. They block the synapses that are involved in the central sensation process. The use of the substances to prevent post-surgical pain is still debated. Two meta-analyses, one by Dr. Hans Clark and another one by Dr. Luis Chaparro, suggest that there might be benefits, but the evidence is weak and no strong conclusions could be made. So if you are a person who is going to be submitted to surgery, how can you prepare to avoid that you develop chronic post-surgical pain? First, ask questions. Don't be afraid to ask your surgeon about the strategies that they are using to prevent post-surgical pain. You also have a consult with the anesthetist prior to surgery, and here is an opportunity to ask questions. I hope this video gave you some ideas of what to ask. 
The nursing staff is also very helpful. They may have many tools and strategies to help you before and after the surgery. Second, if you are a person with some psychological conditions and who isn't, try to talk to a counselor, a psychologist, or do some online cognitive behavior therapy courses or download a meditation, mindfulness, or CBT app to your phone and start practicing now. Third, prehabilitation works. If you increase your overall fitness levels, your body will be more prepared for surgical stress. Well, I hope this helps. If you like this video, don't forget to give a thumbs up here and to subscribe to this channel. And watch my next video here. Goodbye.